Despite recent setbacks, I've made a ton of development progress on my indie game Moonshire. Specifically, there's 10 big updates that I've made in the past month. First off, I've made some huge improvements to the level design. The first dungeon featured in the demo is this cloud area, and prior to these updates it didn't really feel like a challenge, and there was barely anything to do. I spent a ton of time redoing the entire layout, and expanding it into a good early challenge for the game. It introduces simple gimmicks like moving cloud platforms, ones that require electricity to activate, and also this dungeon finally gives the player a way to destroy breakable objects. Throughout the demo, there's some breakable rocks in caves, or secret walls that you can't get past. In other games, you might use bombs to break these apart, but I wanted to do something a bit different. Instead, certain weapons have explosive attacks, and this leans more into the focus of weapon variety in my game. I'm trying to add more weapons with each update, just so the player has plenty of options and can switch things up as often as they want. I'm trying to do more than just make different skins for the same weapon. I'd like each one to have something unique about it. Maybe it has a different combo of attacks, or it provides armor as extra health, or it attacks at a distance. There's lots of ways to add variety. And originally, there were no weapons in the game, only small items like rocks and bombs that you could pick up and throw. When I converted everything to weapons, I still kept the throwing mechanic, but in the end, I think breaking a weapon will normally be reserved for healing, since you can destroy any weapon that you're holding in order to fully heal. Either throwing a weapon shouldn't break it, or instead, I implemented a whole new mechanic, charge attacks. Instead of throwing away a weapon, when you charge up your attack, you'll perform a powerful, unique ability that's different for every weapon. This is another method that will help a lot with weapon variety. I have two types of axes, for example. Their attacks are pretty similar, but the armor values are different, the attack speeds are different, and the charge attacks are different. So there's lots of ways for me to balance the weapons and provide different pros and cons for players to consider when they choose which weapons to carry and which will be used to heal. Now, having a bunch of weapon options in combat isn't very useful if there's nothing to fight, so I've added more enemies, more enemy types, and more enemies in total. Recent versions of the game have felt a bit empty, where outside of the bosses, there really weren't very many opportunities to fight enemies. I'm working to fill out the world a bit more, and the Cloud Dungeon was the first step in doing this. There are a lot more enemies wandering around, and there's three sections where it becomes a short arena battle with waves of enemies. Even with these updates, I still think that more stuff needs to be going on in any given area. Since I'll be redesigning all other parts of the game, I'd like to go into that process with a clear vision of what layout would be both fun to play and also visually interesting. One aspect of world building that I've been holding off on is the narrative. Specifically, I'm talking more about the small, contained narrative for any given area. For example, in a Zelda dungeon, there's normally some story motivation for why you're exploring a dungeon in the first place. I think that Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom do this perfectly, where each area has characters that explain their local conflicts and what Link can do to help. By completing the dungeon, it resolves the smaller story for that area, while also progressing the overall narrative of saving Hyrule. There's multiple points of story motivation for doing any particular piece of content, and I tried to incorporate that same mentality in my dungeon. At first, you're helping out some human characters who were attacked by the Dai Tengu, and after a short boss fight, you're carried up to the cloud area. This eventually leads to a new character that gives some background information, asks for your help, and provides you with some simple directions. Even though the story being told here isn't complicated, it still gives some extra motivation to explore, and there is a reward provided at the end, specifically coming from the dialogue with this character. It's all optional though. If a player wanted to rush through and skip talking to anyone here, that's perfectly fine. After the main content of the dungeon, you'll face the dungeon boss, and I've made a lot of improvements to the overall presentation. The attack patterns of this boss have been made more interesting, where she has new options in her rotation. These options change and get more challenging over the course of the fight, which is split up into a few different phases. My favorite new attack is when she zooms around the screen, and you have to either dodge or hit her away. This is definitely a challenging fight, and I kept in mind that some players may die more than a few times before finally beating it. When I did the dungeon layout redesign, 
I made it so the elevator to the boss was close to the central save point, so getting back into another boss attempt should be really quick. Winning the fight still grants the same reward as before, but it now ties back into the narrative. Speaking of, this character in general is more complicated than any other one in the game so far. To make this easier to create, and also make it easier for me to make more characters in the future, I put together a whole new NPC dialogue builder, where each NPC now has its own conversation map. This map, or just a list of tables, has all the details for everything that the character does and says, but keeps all of the coding logic separate. The NPC has any number of states, and each state could have its own character animation, list of dialogue strings to say, player choices to make, conditional item checks, sound effects, and plenty more options, so I can define any combination of complex dialogue options in here. This means that making new characters just requires defining a new map like this, and no new coding has to be done, making my life easier, but also it makes mod support for NPCs more achievable, since modders can use a format exactly the same as this in order to create custom characters. To complement this update, I finally added translation support, meaning that all text in the game can finally be translated to other languages. This was a simple but time-consuming task. Before, any text that you would see in-game would look like this, where the string was hard-coded at any given spot in the code. But I went through every single file and converted all of these strings to some variable that's loaded from a specific language file. This file can be swapped out at any given time, so it's easy to change the language to whatever the player prefers. That is, once I get everything translated. My friend Wolf translated a few lines to French, but I'm going to wait before translating anything else until the text is a bit more finalized. Pretty much every update sees some dialogue or text changes, so in order to save on development costs, I'm going to wait until the demo is in a more finished state before hiring translators. Connecting to and calling the Steam APIs was a challenge on its own, but thanks to that work, I'm able to utilize more Steam-specific features, like achievements. This update includes the very first achievement, which you get for combining your first piece of jewelry. It'll be very easy for me to add more, but I want to use them sparingly. I'll definitely have achievements for finding all items, beating all bosses, and other important milestones, but personally, I don't like it when an achievement pops up all the time or after every boss. At that point, it's just annoying. My final update, in addition to everything else, was Mac support. Going into this, I thought for sure it would be an easy process getting my game to run through Steam on Mac. I've done plenty of testing on Mac throughout development, and I've had it working for a long time. However, even though the game ran great on my own Mac, the challenge was packaging the app properly for Steam so that it can run seamlessly on any Mac. The first step to doing this is getting the app notarized by Apple. This means that Apple runs some scripts on your app to help with validating all the bundled files, and it'll attach a digital signature to the app. In order to do all this, you need an Apple developer account, which costs $99 per year to maintain. After it exports the notarized app, you can use the Steamworks SDK content builder to upload the app to Steam. That also took some trial and error to figure out, but thankfully, I eventually managed to get everything working properly, and Mac is officially supported. Now both Windows users and Mac users are able to try out the Steam demo for free. Adding the game to your wishlist is a great way to support the project, by the way. Sharing your bug reports and feedback is also helpful, and the best way to do that is through Discord. I have a fresh new Discord server up and running. You can find the invite link in the description. Thanks so much for your support, and thank you for watching.